Well, let me have you turn to Job 22. Job chapter 22. I have a, just two verses I want to read, which will be the focus. These are, these are very simplistic words in the Bible, and yet probably one of the most useful phrases uh, that you could come across in your Bible. Job chapter 22, verses 21 and 22. It says, Agree with God and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Receive instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. Now, what I'm not going to do this, this evening is deal with, there are a lot of questions, of course, as you work through Job, and you have Job's friends trying to counsel him, and there's, there's complexity there of, well, are these guys saying the right thing? Are they saying the wrong thing? Are they maybe saying the right thing but from the wrong heart? And there's all kinds of questions there, and I'm not really here to deal with that question right now. What I can say for sure is these words are very true words. These words are very useful words for every single individual. And my focus is really just what's found there at the beginning of verse 21 when he says, agree with God and be at peace. And as I said, these are, these are very, very simple words, um, but I think when understood in all of its implications and its application for us in our lives as Christians and otherwise, um, it's numerous. These three words, I think, come with such a degree of force. In fact, if we were to even consider all of the ways in which these three words could even be applied in our own lives, it's so multifaceted, I don't even think we could, we, we certainly couldn't deal with them all in one night, um, in one message. It is, it is such a universal statement that can be made both to the unsaved and to the saved, to agree with God and thereby, and thereby find yourself at peace no matter no matter where you are whoever you may be in in whatever circumstances that you can find yourself with the lord these words hold the solution to everything in god's created universe this is i think the summation of how we can be rightly related to god to come to agree with him and to agree with him about everything. Anything God says, agree with it. Anything God does, agree with it. Anything God desires, to agree with it. And brethren, there's, there's really no other pathway for us anyway. I think the, one of the pressing realities of this passage is that the things of God are not up for debate. You can read and read and read your Bible, and there's no verse in the Bible that says, argue with God. Maybe he will compromise with you. There is no verse in the Bible that says such a thing, but there is a verse in the Bible that tells you to agree with God, and you will be at peace. And peace will just simply not come any other means but agreement and submission to God. And I think the sooner we settle that in our minds the sooner we'll be able to receive the promised blessing of peace that comes with such a thing. And I know that, that a statement like this, there's so, I mean, this is a big book. And to grab one phrase, and it might seem so simple, maybe even overly simple. But let me ask you this, brethren. If, if you could imagine what things would be like in the world if all people would heed these simple words to just agree with God. And you could, you could forget all the high theology. You could forget all the apologetics and all the stuff that we bring into Christianity and we often make it far too complicated. But if you could just sum everything up with this simple truth, if you could take this one truth and live your entire life by it, what do you think would happen? What do you think would happen if the world would grasp this very simple reality, this one thing, that if all people would agree with God about their sinfulness 
and their need for a savior. If all people would agree with God about the person and work of Christ, if all people would hear the word of God and simply agree with it and not try to make themselves God instead, if all people who claim the name of Christ would agree with God and obey him and submit themselves to his will and his desires. It seems clear to me, brethren, that, that three words could transform a church a city, a city, a state, even an entire world. But of course, obviously, it, it, it has to start smaller. It has to begin in a smaller context. And so maybe we can just begin with ourselves here tonight. I think these words could transform the entire world we live in, but it has to transform us first. It has to start with our individual lives. And so maybe if we can grasp it ourselves, we can bring it to the world and it can be grasped by, by the world outside. So my intent really is very simple. These words have been seared into my own mind, and I want them seared into your mind. I want you to walk away, that you would live the rest of your days with an all-consuming reality lived by this principle, that you would agree with God. And that you would then receive that promised peace that comes with agreeing with your creator, with your maker. And there's two ways I'm going to apply this passage tonight. Um, very simply, we're going to look at two broad categories. One being the lost. One being sort of this evangelistic call to the unconverted. And the other is applying it to Christians, to saved people. Because this verse, again, as I said, can be really applied across the board. So we got two categories. So let's start with this. This verse is certainly an evangelistic call. It's, it's not only that, but it certainly is that. It is a call to the lost. In fact, undoubtedly, probably some of you are not reading the same translation that I have here. And some of these different translations bring this phrase across a bit differently. Some say, be reconciled to God. Some say, come to terms with God. And even, I notice one that says, yield now to God. There's such force in these, in these words. And yet, brethren, as we go out and we bring the gospel to the world, we evangelize with people in our lives, really what we're saying to the lost world is simply that reality, to lay down your weapons before God, to agree with him, to come to terms with him, and to be reconciled to him. And there's a lot that the lost world must come to agree with, with God. First thing, I already mentioned it a moment ago. There, there must be agreement with God about sin. And not just sin in a general sense. That's not, that won't do. Not just that sin is, is over there. It's out there somewhere reserved for the worst of the worst. That's, that won't do, brethren. But rather that it, it comes home and it hits to each individual heart that sin is internal in each and every person. That each person, they themselves, would agree with God and come to recognize that they themselves are a sinner. That they themselves are a rebel against God. That they themselves would come to a recognition, as, as Paul writes in 1 Timothy, and he says about himself, I was a persecutor. I was an insolent opponent of the gospel. I, he says, was a blasphemer. Not, not others, but I was such a thing. And the lost man or woman must come to grips with the fact that our problem is not that we have made a few bad choices, a few mistakes, we've, we've, we've missed a few marks in our day, but we need to agree with God that we are rebellious, wicked sinners in the sight of a holy God, and that God owes us absolutely nothing. I mean, brother, when you read the Bible, you, you come across, when God speaks of those who are outside, those who don't have Christ. I mean, have you, brethren, let's, let's just look at these words. In, in Romans chapter 1, 
These are undoubtedly familiar words, but maybe if we can read them with fresh eyes. Romans 1, starting in verse 29, notice the kind of language that the Bible is using in reference to to those who are unconverted, to those who don't have Christ, who have not been saved by the grace of God. Listen to this language, starting in verse 29. Paul says, They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. Okay, well, that's, that's pretty general. Not too, we, we like that word. That's a biblical word, unrighteousness. Well, what else does he say? Evil, covetousness, Malice, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. These are strong words. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God. This is, this is no light language. Haters of God, he says. Insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. These next, these, these next four I have marked in my Bible, big four. I find them to just be four ways of describing individuals that these are not words that we typically use, brethren. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. I mean, when you think of somebody who is ruthless, you, you, you think of some dictator who, who slaughtered millions of his people. Ruthless people. But this is how the Bible speaks about those who don't have Christ. This is the kind of language of what sin has done to humanity. Another passage very familiar, Romans chapter 3, Paul says, None is righteous. Romans 3 verse 10. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He goes on to say near the end of that passage, the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Again, these, I know you know these passages. I know you've read these passages. You're familiar with what they say. But brethren, if you're anything like me, you read over these passages in the Bible and you're so familiar with them that they don't shock you. That the Bible speaks in such dramatic ways about people who don't have Christ. Strong language. And here's the reality. We have got to come to agree with God about this language. Because God's evaluation is the true one. We, we want to make evaluations of ourselves all the time. The lost world wants to make evaluations of themselves. They're always setting the bar depending upon who else they're looking at in comparison to themselves. But this is God's evaluation of, of all of humanity outside of Christ. All of humanity is this. And if we would have peace, we must come first to agree with God. Begin here to agree with God on the nature of our sinfulness. And brethren, you know this, this is a very humbling thing to come to grips with. To agree with God that you really are in desperate need of his mercy. You need grace. You need something that you haven't earned and you haven't deserved. If, if men and women are to receive any type of righteous status before God, they have to first come to grips with the fact that they don't have one themselves. They don't have anything to offer God in and of themselves. And brethren, there have been countless people. I have many of them in my own family who have clenched their fist and have gone to hell because they refuse to believe this reality. And undoubtedly many of you probably know and have people in your life who will not accept this evaluation, who will not accept that this is what God says about humanity outside of Christ. And they will go on their way into judgment because they are too proud 
to believe that that, is, that that can be true about them. How important it is to agree with God on this matter. But that's not all. That's not all. Even still, this evangelistic call, this call to the lost, there's more that must be agreed upon. It must come to be agreed that God alone has the place of authority. That people, you and I, humanity does not sit on the throne. But that God sits on the throne. And that his rule must be recognized. In fact, again, one of those translations I quoted earlier, it says to come to terms with God. And this is so very true, brethren. And, and God, has, God has written his treaty. And he has set his terms of agreement. And his terms are very simple. What a, for those of you who have come to terms with God, what are his terms? Repent. Absolute surrender, right? These are God's terms. When you think of this imagery presented in the Bible, you, you don't want to think of two armies that have come together and they're meeting to write out terms of, of mutual acceptance and respect and honor, you know, limited authority on both sides so that nobody's overstepping their bounds. God has written his terms, and he's, it's a treaty of peace, but it is a treaty that is very simple. His treaty is you come... You come recognizing my authority. You come in complete and absolute surrender or, and submission, or you don't come at all. These are God's terms, brethren. And, and again, it's, it's, it's not a treaty of, of issues and problems. It's a treaty of peace God offers. He says, if you want peace, here it is. I've written it out. If you sign it, absolute peace. But you must come in total and complete surrender to God. And, and, but what we often find, and, you've, and, and you speak to people in your lives, evangelizing, coworkers, whatever it may be, and you know what you find, because I find it too, that the heart of lost men and women, they often speak the very same words as Pharaoh spoke in the book of Exodus. You know, Moses comes to him and, and he tells him, Yahweh the one true and living God, Yahweh says, let my people go. And you know what, Moses, or what Pharaoh responds? How does Pharaoh respond to Moses? He says, who is Yahweh that I should obey him? This is Pharaoh's response. Who is Yahweh that I should obey? He was soon going to find out. Very soon he was going to find out who Yahweh was and that he would do very well to agree with this God rather than be at enmity with him, to recognize his authority. But this is the way that many lost in the world view God. They refuse to agree with God's place of authority. They don't want to accept his terms. They're, they're like those in the parable of Jesus who say, we don't want this man to rule over us. A rejection of the terms of peace, a rejection of God's place of authority, But brethren, we have got to come to agree with God on this, that God holds his place of authority and we do not. Another thing that we must come to agree with God about, another aspect to this evangelistic call is we must come to agree with God on his means of salvation. How it is that he has decided to save mankind. That God became a man. A normal man, just like you and I, there were certainly elements about him that were different, but don't think for a second that Jesus wasn't human, and he lived his life among sinners, and this man, this man who came, who was God in the flesh, came in no spectacular glory. He is not what many thought he would be. He had no glorious house. He had no glorious job, although in our day, the, a carpenter is somewhat of a, I don't know, it, Jesus was a carpenter, and so we, we, we view it highly. But in his day, being a carpenter was nothing special. He had no glorious job. He, had, he lived in no glorious place. Brethren, the Bible calls him the king of glory. And yet when he came, he had no glory to speak of. And he was mostly poor. He was hated by all of the most respected people in his day. 
and he spent most of his time with the weak and outcast. He received no audience with those who were high and influential, and people of stature refused to associate with him. Brethren, if he lived in our day, he would be mocked, and he would be scoffed at. And to think that this very individual is the hope of the nations. There were, brethren, he, he doesn't fit the categories that we might think he would fit. And yet this is the means, the way in which God has chosen to save the world through this individual. And beyond that, beyond what his life was imaged as, he suffered He suffered his whole life. He suffered the worst imaginable death that anybody could suffer. And not only did he suffer that death, he suffered it in between two criminals. He's crucified with other criminals. This man is literally, as Paul says, cursed by God. And this is God's message of salvation. You you could surely see why Paul would say, that to the Jews, this is a scandal, an absolute scandal. And to the Gentiles, well, it's just laughable. It's craziness. But there's got to be a recognition, an agreement with God, and acceptance of that, that this is God's perfect plan. This is the way that God has chosen to save humanity through this Man, you remember this story. I think this is greatly portrayed in a story in the Old Testament, the story of, of Naaman in uh, 2 Kings 5. And if you remember, Naaman is this commander of the Syrian army. And he's, he's, he is a leper. So he goes into Israel, and he's looking for healing. And so he goes and he finds Elisha, and Elisha tells him, go and wash in the Jordan and you'll be clean. And you know his response. Naaman's response, he is angry. And he's angry for a couple of reasons. Um, First of all, he's angry that Elisha didn't even come out. Elisha sent somebody else to go out and speak to this man. But also, he's very angry about the way in which he's told to deal with this problem. All he tells him is, go and wash in the Jordan. And Naaman is thinking, he... Where's Elisha? Where's the man of God? He's not going to come out and do the miraculous thing and wave his hand, he says, and, and treat me and, and, and fix me and do, do it this way that I think he ought to do it in this miraculous, grandiose way. He's not going to come out and address me and deal with this problem. He basically tells him, you want me to go into the Jordan and take a bath? That's what you're asking me to do? And not only that, you want me to go into that river? He says, I got other rivers back at home, bigger rivers, cleaner rivers, better rivers, and you want me to go bathe in the Jordan? This is the way that you're going to tell me God is going to deal with this issue? What kind of message is this? Well, Naaman, you can go on your way and not do what the man of God has said, but, but if you want peace and you want cleansing... However foolish you might think his message is, you're going to have to agree with it. And you're going to have to obey it and do as the man of God has said. This is the way of redemption for you, and there's no other, there's no other way. And yet there's even more that needs to be agreed with God. Agreement with God upon the exclusive nature of this salvation that there is only one God and that there is only one way to that God. And brethren, you know as well as I do, when you speak to people in the world, this is probably one of the things they hate the most. You know what they say because they say it to me too. You mean to tell me that all the other people in the world that worship their God and they worship their God sincerely with all their heart that all these other people who worship whatever God it is that they have that all these people are in the end going to be damned because they don't have the one true God is that our message is that what we say brethren yes and you know why we say that 
Why is that our message? Is it because you made that up? No, it's not. Brethren, the reason why that is our message is because that is what God says. And because we've come to agree with him about that very truth. This is what God says, brethren. You didn't decide that. Listen to these words. Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. You don't have to turn there. Just listen to this for a minute. Thus says Yahweh, the king of Israel and his redeemer, Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. It's, God is, it's as though God is looking out. I don't see any others. There's no other God out there. Besides me, there is no other God. He says, who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him come forth. If there's another God, let him come forth and declare himself. He says, let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what, it is, what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. There is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Brethren, the reason why we proclaim this exclusive way of salvation is because God has proclaimed it. It is because that is how, that is how God has ordered salvation. And we've got to come to agree with God that there's no other way of entrance. There's one door. And Christ says, it's me. If you don't enter by this door, you don't enter at all. Now, there could be a lot more that, that could be said about this, uh, this evangelistic call, this call to the lost. But it starts with these very simple words, to agree with God and to be at peace. And there very well may be some here who have not come to agree with God on these terms. And all I can do is urge you to come speedily to sign that treaty that God has offered. This treaty of peace that God offers to you. And he will receive you. But, brethren, there's a lot more for us in this verse who have signed that treaty of peace. Even if, you've, even if you already have come to agree with God on all of those things that are, have already been stated, that's not all that this verse in Job has for us. This is for Christians too. Once you've come to agree with God on everything I've already previously stated, we have to maintain a position of submission and willingness to yield to God. And so we are called also to agree with him. And so I have a few ways in which this can be applied for us. The Christian, we could start right here, must begin by agreeing with God on this very book. This book is God's book. And we have got to come to agree with God about it. This is the standard, brethren, by which we live our lives, or at least it ought to be. And we have got to lay down every other form of so-called wisdom and knowledge, and we have to submit ourselves to God's word, God's way of wisdom and knowledge, even if our own feelings don't agree with it at times. We've got to come to believe whatever God says in his word, even if we feel like we come into conflict with it at some point. And maybe I would be the first to raise my hand, if you've come into conflict with the word of God. And brethren, here's the thing. If you and the word of God have a collision, you must be willing to submit. You must be. Even if you don't understand it. Because here's the thing. When you, when you begin to question God's word, you begin to doubt whether or not it is to be believed, you begin to be exactly how the devil was in the garden. That's the way of Satan. You know that ancient lie. Has God really said? And this is, this, is the, this is the battle that has to be fought in the heart of a fallen humanity. This is the battle that has to be fought in every one of your hearts. Even if you've, even if you've come to the Lord Jesus and God has given you a new heart with new desires... You have to battle this because you're still part of a fallen humanity. And a fallen humanity that frankly 
doesn't want to hear what God has to say all the time, but sometimes wants to just hear what sounds good. It wants to just hear what makes them feel good. You remember these words of Paul as he writes to Timothy, and he says, people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And this is the reality that we have got to battle in our own lives day in and day out as we come to the word of God and we have got to submit to it and agree with God in regards to it. And again, you see examples of this, good and bad, all throughout the scripture. You see, you see an example of this so clearly in, in 1 Kings 22. Again, you don't necessarily have to go there because I'm not going to read a passage from there. I just want to give you the story, familiar story. But you have this situation with King Ahab. And he essentially wants to go to war, and he wants to drag Jehoshaphat and Judah along with him into this war. And he meets with Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat tells Ahab, we need to inquire first of the Lord. What would God have us to do? That's basically what they're asking. What does God want? And so Ahab, he goes out, and he gathers 400 prophets. And they all say, go for it. It's going to go great, right? And, and Jehoshaphat comes back, and it's almost like, look, we're not looking for just any prophet. We're looking for prophets of Yahweh. You got any of those? Any of those we can consult? You got a prophet of Yahweh we can inquire from? And Ahab comes back, and he says, yeah, we do have one of those. But there's a problem. Ahab does not like this guy. He says, we do, yeah, we may have one whom we can inquire, Micaiah, the son of Imlah but I hate him. Why? Why does he hate him? He never prophesies good concerning me, but only evil. There you go. I mean, he's, he's basically saying, I don't like him because he doesn't tell me what I want to hear. And yet, brethren, is this not what we often find happening in the lives of Christians. We say all day long, just like it was in the days of Jeremiah. What do they do? They send Jeremiah away. They say, Jeremiah, go ask the Lord. What would the Lord have us do? And Jeremiah comes back and he says, I sought the Lord and he wants you to go into exile. And they say, you're a liar. We're not doing any of that stuff. And they put on this show. Right? They put on this good show of, well, we're going to do what God says. We, we want to hear what God says, and we want to do what God says. And then yet, when it comes down to it, they don't. And brethren, this is, this is something that has to be fought and won in the life of a Christian day in and day out. To not only be willing to hear from God, but to actually do what it is that God says. To agree with him concerning his word. And if we claim the name of Christian... And if we stake our very existence and our salvation on the truth of this book, brethren, we have got to submit to it in all of its parts, not just the parts we want. Another thing that as Christians we must come to agree with God about is not just agreeing with God about his word, but also agreeing with him in terms of obedience to that word. We need to yield ourselves in obedience to God and to agree with him that it is good and right. That, that what God commands of us is good and right. And that what God forbids is good and right. Not in the sense that you do it and it's good, but that he says it's bad and that's right. That is a good thing that God says is bad and you stay away from it, right? We have got to come to agree with God about this very reality in our lives. Because you, you know the lie of the devil and the world and they want to, to, to convince you that what your God requires of you is too much. That he's overreaching, that he's harsh, that he wants to starve you of freedom and that his law is nothing but a burden that you need to be rid of and you need to be freed from. This is the lie. The devil and the world, they want you convinced of that. But brethren, we know Christ's words. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle, he says. 
not harsh, not overbearing. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find burden for your souls, rest. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is what? It's easy. And my burden is light. These are the words of Christ, brethren. God is not in the business of making worn out slaves who are starved of good things. That is not who God is. He wants to give rest. He wants to give freedom. He wants to give joy. And brethren, we've got to come to agree with God that this is the reality, that his commandments are not burdensome, that they are good, that they are right, and beyond that, for you as a Christian to recognize that they promise you blessing. But again, this is, this is a lie that comes to the devil. You remember it in the garden, right? And what was he wanting to convince Eve of? That God was holding out on her. That there was something good for her that God didn't want her to have. And he was being a harsh master by not allowing her to have this thing. And he would have us believe the same. He would have us believe that obedience to God is really of no benefit. And that God is holding out on us. And this is exactly what the Israelites found themselves doing as they come back from exile in Babylon. And you can read it in Malachi. God comes to rebuke them. And he comes to rebuke them and he says to them that they have spoken hard words against him. And he says, these are these, are these hard words that you have spoken to me. And here's, here's what they had said. It is vain to serve God. How do you get to such a place? After all that God had done, for this nation and the overwhelming flow of blessings upon them, and yet they get to a place where they say, it is vain to serve God. What is, they say, what is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before Yahweh of Ho What is the profit? They've thought it futile to walk in God's ways. Futile to serve him. They've essentially come to think there's, there's really no benefit if we do, and there's no benefit if we don't. It really doesn't matter what we do. Brother, this is exactly actually how Job himself describes the wicked. In Job, he says this, The wicked say, What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we get if we pray to him? You see, this is, this is the way of the wicked heart that speaks. What profit is this to serve this God? There's no benefit in it for me. But brethren, we know better than this. The Christian knows better than that, that there is great benefit in serving God. And there is great blessing in it. And we've got to come to agree with God about this, that there really is benefit in obedience to God. That his commandments really are good for you and I. That obedience in the Bible is always presented as a means by which blessing comes. Now, it's not an absolute one-to-one -one correlation. Brethren, there are a lot of passages in the Bible that you just cannot get around. The general rule is that those who are obedient to God will see good in their lives. Psalm 5, verse 12, you bless the righteous, O Yahweh, you cover him with favor as with a shield. Proverbs 13, 21, the righteous are rewarded with good. You know these words from Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and what? What's the result? What comes to you? All other things, right? Brethren, listen. This is not prosperity gospel stuff. This is just Bible verses, right? We've got to agree with God that obedience to him does result in blessing and benefit. There's just no way around it. The Bible preaches such things. I mean, if you read, go with me to Psalm 34. These words are striking. Psalm 34. Look at verses 8 through 14. He says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear Yahweh, all you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. 
The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek Yahweh lack no good thing. Have you ever read that before? Listen to what he says next. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of Yahweh. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Do you want this? I want this. Well, how do you get it? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Brethren, there is a tie in the Bible. Obedience and blessing. A tie that can't be separated. And I recognize that a lot of this has an eternal perspective to it. But brethren, don't let that lead you into a place where you don't recognize that the Bible does tie these things together in a very real reality here and now in your life. Those who rebel against God, they might seem to prosper, pro prosper for a little bit, but it won't last. Remember Psalm 73, that Psalm of Asaph. He's in this despair because he looks out at the wicked and he sees them blessed and he says they're fat and they're full and they're rich. And then he says, but then I went to the house of God. And he comes to realize it won't last. That the righteous will stand and the wicked will not. But brethren, again, we have got to come to agree with God that there is a blessing for obedience. And, and, and a very real one in your life here and now. But not just even in the physical realm. But, brethren, your spiritual life. You, you know these words of Christ. He says in John 14, he says, Anyone who loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. You want that. You want that. And Jesus says, it comes by keeping his word word the blessing of obedience brethren we have got to come to agree with god this is good for you walking in obedience to the word is good for your soul it is good for your entire being here's our last thing i want us to think about this last application that we can consider as christians that we would come to agree with God about his will and his purposes in our lives. Brethren, this is so vital if we are going to live at peace with God. If we are doubting God, if we are questioning his motives, if we are unsure whether what he is doing or what he has done in our lives is really for our good, we will not only have no peace, but brethren, you will be in dangerous place of apostasy if we are doubting God in that way. Now you say, well, that's extreme. Sounds extreme. But brethren, that is not extreme. When you begin to look at what God is doing or, or has done in your life in the past, and you begin to despise it. And you begin to think that, that God has got it wrong. That God has done something wrong, or that, that you have a better way in which it ought to have been done. I'm telling you, brethren, you are not far from despising God himself altogether. And I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen in our very own church I've, I've, I've looked a woman right in the eyes who, who I spoke, who I evangelized, who I spoke to about Christ, who I baptized, who I saw speak to others about Christ. And I heard her tell me that she believes that God has treated her poorly because he has not done for her what she thought he should have done for her. And she looked me right in the eyes, brethren, and she told me, I don't care if I go to hell. 
because I will do for myself here better than God will. But then this is not extreme to tell you this. This is reality. I've seen it. I've, I've, I've lived it with people in our church. Brother and the Lord himself brings this out. Another probably familiar passage to you in Matthew 11 when, when Jesus speaks concerning John the Baptist. And it's a very interesting passage because you have this scene where John is in prison and he hears about the ministry of Jesus, what Jesus is doing out there in the world and he hears about undoubtedly some very interesting things that, that Jesus is going around and he's, he's healing random people who Jesus has never met before. Meanwhile, John the Baptist is sitting there in prison. He's healing Romans. And John is sitting in prison. And John is confused as well as you might be as well if you found yourself in that situation. And you know what happens, right? John sends some of his disciples to Jesus and they ask him, are you the one or are we waiting for somebody else? And Jesus responds. He tells these disciples, he says, you go back and you tell John what you just saw. And what they just saw was the blind receiving their sight, the lame walking, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And then he says this. He adds this statement at the end. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Why in the world does Jesus say such a thing in regards to John? And I think, brethren, it is because this is John's danger. John is sitting in a prison cell while Jesus heals Romans. And the question undoubtedly on John's mind is, what in the world is going on here? This is not the way this is supposed to be. You're supposed to come and kill all of them and save all of us. And why are you not doing that? Why are you not doing what I think you should be doing? And brethren, I'm telling you, when you begin to think in this manner, when you begin to be offended by God, you enter into a very, a very dangerous place. In fact, this, that word that is used in the passage that, where Jesus says, blesses the one who is not offended by me, it gets used in a bunch of other places in the Bible. And it gets translated in a little bit different way that I think helps us see really what's going on here. Listen to this. Matthew 18, verse 8, Jesus says, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, that's the same word. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. Then he says it again in Matthew 13, verses 20 and 21. Here's how it's translated. It's the, it's the passage of the parable of the sower. And here's what Jesus says. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, he immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. This is the very same word. It's the same kind of language. Listen, this is what's being presented to you when Jesus calls upon John and those listening, don't be offended by what I'm doing. And it's because the idea is that people can become so scandalized by what God has done or what by God is doing and they take offense at it. And they begin to sin in the way they think about God and ultimately they fall away because of it. To not be content in the will of God. And brethren, as hard as it can be, we have got to come to grips with the fact that God does not always operate in ways that we think he should or in ways that we might want him to. Just think of these different stories in the Bible. Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda and it says there that there were a multitude of people Invalids, sick, couldn't walk, whatever, paralyzed. And Jesus heals one guy. Why doesn't he heal everybody? You know what happened in the Bible with James? He gets thrown in prison. He's martyred. Well, just a few pages later, someone else gets thrown in prison. Peter. What happens to him? He's let go. The angel comes and he gets him out of prison. 
God essentially kills off an entire world except for Noah. He let Israel be enslaved for 400 years before he brought them redemption. There are so many things in the Bible that really all you can say is, blessed is the one who is not offended by God, who comes to agree with God about his will. But then you would go insane trying to think of all of the, the ways in which God is working these things out. I was thinking about all these different examples. You think of, of, of William uh, Tyndale, translator of, of the Bible. You know what happened with him? He translated the first five books of the Old Testament, and he sails off to go and get it printed, and the ship goes down. No backups, no copies, all of it gone in an instant. And you're just left going, how do you make sense of such a thing? You would think, that's not what I would do, but that is what God did. And brethren, you undoubtedly have things like this in your own life. Some of you probably have major health issues, and yet you look out and many of the unrighteous in the world live in perfect health. There are men and women of God who often seem to die off far before their time, and the, righteous, or the unrighteous live on seemingly forever. Some of you have lost children, and others haven't. Some of you are given by God's grace a sense of financial stability. And some of you have not. And it is not right to be angry about God about that. Some of you were brought up in very faithful, God-fearing homes. And others of you suffered horrible abuse and tragic childhoods. And that was God's plan, and that was God's purpose and the list goes on brethren and sometimes there's not much more that you can say but don't be offended by God again sometimes there's not much more that you can say other than agree with God about his will don't get to a place where you get angry at God and you begin to doubt whether or not what he is doing or what he has done for you is for your good even if you can't understand it I, I love these words of Mary she finds out that she's going to become pregnant with Jesus. And undoubtedly, this was a pretty... <laughs> I can only imagine what that would have felt like. Um, any of you were to show up here and say, I am pregnant with the Holy Spirit. Nobody in here is going, oh, yeah, for sure. That would have been a, a pretty confusing thing for her. And yet she says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And brethren, the question is, can we speak this way about our lives? As we think about God's will for us and his purpose and his plan for us, can we say, whatever the Lord's will is, let it be to me according to your word. Even in the midst of difficult circumstances, you know these, these words in this hymn, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Brethren, we've got to agree with God on this. These very simple words, and I want them seared into your mind, that you would grasp them, you would live your lives by them, to always agree with God on everything and have peace 